a survey indicates that people use their cellular phones on average of 1.5 years before buying a new one. So they're saying on average, on average, people use their phone for one and a half years before investing in a new one. The standard deviation is 0.25 year. We pick one cellular phone users at random, one. What is the chance? What's the probability that this user will use his or her phone for less than one year before buying a new one? So what you need to find, guys, we need the probability of X less than one. How would you do that using technology? What do you think? Is it likely to find the people who would just buy a phone and use it for less than one year and then buy a new one? What do you think? Is this common or not common? Not common. Not common, definitely. So I think the probability is going to be very low. Let's see. It will be normal CDF. What would be the lower, the upper, the mean, and the standard deviation? I already put a sketch for you guys right here. So you guys agree with me that the lower bound will be negative a million? The upper bound will be the one. So this is lower bound LB, upper bound. And then we need the mean, which is what, 1.5. Then we need the standard deviation, guys, which is 0 0.25. And you just use Wait, your question? calculator. Yes. Where'd you get the million from? Well, the negative million is the lower bound. It's the bound from this side. Because this curve extends, you know, indefinitely. And then we always, when we do a lower bound, we use a negative million. And when we use an upper bound from this side, we use a positive a million. You can put one with as many zeros as you want. Okay, got it. I didn't put a million here, I did. You can put a trillion here, but just as many zeros. So less than, we start with a negative a million, greater than we'll put a million on the other side, which I will do another question similar to this. So let me just do this here. So we go to second, distribute, normal CDF. So again, guys, the key function that we used yesterday is number two. And to access number two, you just hit second and variables. Oops, second and variables, normal CDF. Okay, lower, negative a million. Upper is one. The mean is 1.5. The standard deviation 0.25 and find the probability. Probability, the percent, the chance, 0 0.0228. If I ask you guys what percent of people would buy a phone after using it for less than one year? So all you need to change this answer to a percent. How do I change this one to a percent? Multiply by 100. Yep. So as you agreed, I know a student said it's not common to have someone uh, buy a phone and use it for less than one year, unless if you have a lot of money to waste. Actually, the percentage of people who do that, it's only 2.28% of the population, which makes sense. Let's add another question here. What is the probability that you select a cellular phone user who would use the phone for more than two years before investing in a new one. That's not in here, guys. So I just added that up, more than two years. So for more than two years, guys, you have to do probability of X greater than two. And X is the individual. Okay. Let me show you a sketch of this one. And then you can tell me what to put in the formula. The mean is 1.5, guys. And more than two, it will be two and more right here. More than two, you shade to the right of two. Less than one, you shade to the left of one. 
So you guys can tell me what the normal, what the lower bound and upper bound is going to be. Can a student help us here? What would be the lower bound? Two. Negative. Two. There is no negative when you do more than. Oh. So. Two. Two. Positive a million. Positive a million. Correct. And then 1.5 and then 0.25. So here is a hint for you guys. When you do a greater than a number, you put the number first and then you put a million or a trillion and then you put the mean and the standard deviation. And when you do a less than a number, you put the negative million first, then you put that number, look, it's a perfect match, and then you put the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, let's see what's the likelihood that someone is gonna use the phone for more than two years. So you go second, distribute, normal CDF, two, a million, put as many zeros as you want, it doesn't matter. 0 0.0227, so this is the other extreme. So it's the same thing? Yeah. So very few people wait for less than one year to invest in a phone and very few people, you know, just keep the phone for more than two years, according to this exercise. Okay. Professor, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Where'd you find the uh, variable button on the calculator? Oh, the variable right here. Let me see the variable here, but we need distribution. We need the blue one. So in uh, order to do that second. The normal CDF. And then normal CDF. Okay, for this chapter, guys, just highlight these two features and that's it. In this chapter. Um, professor. Five. Yes. Um, when will there, will there be a situation where we use the normal PDF, the number one? No, you won't. We won't? You won't. Okay, so just highlight the CDF so one. Only two and three. We're gonna learn about three shortly. So just two and three in this chapter, guys. Just highlight those two. But the binomial one, we use both of them, the PDF and the CDF. And CDF, yeah, not, not in chapter five. PDF one, it's exactly, right? Exactly, that is correct. And the reason why you don't use, that's a good thing that you brought this up. There is no th such a thing called exact and continuous variables. You cannot say I'm exactly 18 years old. You cannot say I'm exactly 140 pounds. You cannot say, you can say I'm a little bit over 140, a little bit less than 140, but you cannot say I'm exactly. So that's why we don't need that. Because the probability of someone's weight is 150 pounds exactly is zero. Even if the scale guys shows that it is 150 pounds, that could have been a rounded answer. It could have been like a 149.99. How do we know that? So it can't be exact. There is no such a thing called exact in the continuous variables. And that's why we're not, we'll be, we will not be using the PDF, you know, just now. Exercise six, let's do some more with the normal CDF. A survey indicate that for each trip to the supermarket, a shopper spends an average of 45 minutes. Look guys, how you start uh, uh, sorting out the problem. So the mean is 45, just put the mu here. With a standard deviation of 12, just put the sigma there. The length of time spent on the store is bell-shaped, normally distributed. So it looks like bell-shaped. That's very important. Otherwise, we cannot solve the problem if it's not bell-shaped and is represented by the variable X. A shopper enters the store. What is the probability, guys, that the shopper will spend at the store between 24 and 54 minutes? So the manager of the store wants to know what's the likelihood that someone will walk into the store and spend between 24 and 54 minutes. And I... Uh, in the guided notebook, guys, I'm just guiding you through the steps. I left the blanks here. So what do you think should go here and there, guys? 24 and 54. Thank you. That was easy. 
and you guys know it's normal CDF. And when he gives you two bounds, you don't need a negative a million or positive a million. It's you're between those two, uh, two bounds. So it's 24, then 54, then the mean, which is 45, then the 12, guys. And that's it. It's as simple as that. And um, these are the kinds of questions that I'll be asking you when it comes to the test from this chapter. Just a question like this. All you need, just input this into the calculator and you should get the answer. So 24, 54, uh, 45, 12, and here you go, 0 0.7333. He might ask you what percent of the shoppers will uh, be at the store between 24 and 54 minutes. You change this one to a percent, guys. What I'm trying to tell you here, keep this in mind, guys. When he asks you for percent, or he asks you for a probability, or if he asks you for area under the curve, it's exactly the same thing. So probability means a percent. So if I say the probability that it will rain today is 20%, it's exactly the same thing as saying that the chance of rain, the percent uh, that it will rain, you know, uh, today is 20%. It's exactly the same thing. So what would that 39 be? 39% or what? Where? Um, what is the B? Oh, no, no. That's a probability. He says, what's the probability that the shopper will be in the store for more than 39 minutes? So... We want to find the probability of x being more than 39. So now we want to know what is the likelihood that someone will come to the store and spend more than 39 minutes. Now you need to find this probability. So what would that be, guys? Can you help me? What would be the lower bound, upper bound, mean, and standard deviation? 39. Would it be 39 and 54? No, not 54. 54 is, is uh, he said it, it was in part A. More than 39, there is no limit on how much you stay at the store. So it's 39 and up. And remember, up, we use a million for that. Okay. Does that make sense? He says more than 39, he didn't put a limit, you know, just in how, how long you can stay. Definitely, nobody will stay at the store more than the opening hours of the store but we don't need to figure them out just to be on the safe side we just put a large number here and then guys you put 45 and then you put it 12. all right okay you want to compute this for me let's see normal cdf watch dice 39 is first, a million. I put as many zeros as I want, and then 45 and 12. 0 0.6915. So the manager knows that the likelihood of a customer spending more than 39 minutes at the store is about 69%. There's a good chance that most of the customers are going to spend a lot of time at the store because the probability is high. Okay, let's see part C, guys. Part C is related to part B. I'd like you to pay attention to it. If 200 shoppers enter the store, how many shoppers would you expect to be in the store for more than 39 minutes? So 200 come to the store. The manager wants to plan how many staff they should have on the floor to support you know, those customers. How many of those shoppers do you think guys will gonna be at the store for more than 39 minutes? How do we figure this out? Would you take the number from the, the six, 200 we got from 39? Yes, we know the probability already. We know the chance. If I tell you guys, 70% of my students earn an A in my class and I have 30 students, I could ask you how many do you think will earn an A? All you need to do guys, 
Just take the theory and multiply by 70%. And if I know the probability that a shopper will spend at the store more than 39 minutes is 0 0.6915. All you need to do guys is just take the 0 0.6915 and multiply by 200. So I said here, does it help to find a probability of X greater than 39? Definitely, yes. It does, we need it. So uh, 200 times 0 0.6915. I got 138.3, 138 customers. And uh, this is, guys, how businesses decide, you know, just on uh, staffing, how many staff, how many employees they should have on the floor. They try to run, you know, their figures and figure out how many customers they're going to have at a certain time of the day. And you guys, you do notice there are times of the day you walk into the store, you see one or two cashier open. And then other times you'll see seven or eight, you know, just open. It's all based on a study like this. Somebody will do the study for the manager of the store, an accountant or someone who knows the statistics and provide all those information. So I hope that you can see the connection, you know, just of uh, uh, what you're learning, you know, just with real life situations here. Uh, exercise seven, triglycerides are type of uh, fat in the bloodstream. The mean triglyceride level in the United States is 134 milligrams. So that's the mean. And the standard deviation, guys, assume that triglyceride levels of the United States uh, are normally distributed, bell-shaped, with a standard deviation of 35, that's sigma. You randomly select one person from the United States, what is the probability that this person's triglyceride level is less than 80? Okay. That's so two. negative a million. All right, one second. Uh, let's do that together. So you said we need a probability. When it is one individual, guys, you just use X here, less than 80. You said negative a million, I agree. And then uh, 80. Mm -hmm. and then 134 and 35 you got it exactly as simple as that guys it's not difficult okay let's see uh second distribute normal cdf negative a million 80, that's gonna be low guys, because not many people have a triglyceride level below 80. Let's see, uh, that's nice. I wish mine was that low, 35. 0 0.0614. So if you change this to a percent guys, about 6% of uh, uh, people who live in the U.S. have a triglyceride level less than 80, which is very good, 6%. Any questions? So you can see was, the, the power negative. of this formula here. Yes? It was negative a million because of the less than problem? Yes, okay. always. You can tie it to this exactly. And then this one will be next. And if it is greater than 80, you begin with 80 and put a million next to it. You can put a million, a trillion. Like I tell students, if this 80 was an 80 million, for example, here, then you have to, to put, you know, more than a million. You just put negative one with so many zeros to, to make it, you know, just look big. But you won't have any large numbers, so. A million compared to 80 is very big. So that's that's good. 
And actually, look here um, in the screenshot I provided, I put negative 10,000. I mean, no one's triglyceride uh, level is going to go to negative 10,000. And actually, it is safe to replace negative 10,000 or negative a million with one small number. Can you guess what that number is, guys? And you still get the same answer. Negative one. Not even negative one. Go a little bit higher. Zero. Zero. Because no one can have a triglyceride level that is negative. The lowest you can have a zero. And I don't know if there is anyone who doesn't have any triglyceride in their bloodstream. So zero will be safe, guys. It will give you pretty much the same answer. All right. So now let's get to the next section, 5.3. We're going to learn how to do this section using the tables that we have already. And then I'm going to show you how to do it using technology. You and you guys, you can decide uh, which one uh, to use. So we find a probability of Z less than 0 0.77 using table four. They call it table four. And now we're going to do it using technology, guys. Normal CD, yeah. So negative a million. That's good, 0.77 and zero and one. When you work with Z guys, remember it's zero and one. And 7794, if you round to look at the calculator screen guys, if you want to four decimal places it will be exactly the same, 0.7794, all right. When you work with uh, the Z score table, you put zero and one for the standard deviation and mean? Yes. It's always zero and one. You don't put zero and one when you work with the table, only when you use the technology. But when you work with table, just use it as is. But zero and one for Z, because Z is defined to be a bell-shaped curve with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. Z score, it's all Z scores here. Okay, guys, here's the question that I'm going to ask you now. Please pay attention to it. Section 5.3 is working backward, you know, just on section 5.2. So let me just show you what the question is. And please pay attention to the table because you're going to get me the question, the answer of the table. Look what I'm going to do. And once you pick this up, this is it with the Okay, um, this area, guys, that I shaded is 0 0.7324, this area. Can you guess what the question is, guys? Less than... Uh... Less than what value? So you want to find this value right here. Did you notice the difference, guys? Look what we did earlier. That's what I gave you Z, and I asked you to find me the area. And one student read it for me, and he says it's 0 0.7794. Now I'm going to do the total opposite, guys. I'm going to put the area in there and tell you what was the Z score where the area to its left will be 0 0.7324. Can you? So here's what you're going to do, guys. You're going to look inside the table and looking for this value rather than doing outside as we did, you know, in the earlier one. And then once you find this value, maybe you can trace the Z score. Can you look? Just look around here, guys. 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.2. Okay, so what would be together? Uh, yeah, you're correct. The, the student says it's right here. I agree. What would be the Z score? Let's read the Z score. 0.62. Exactly. 0.62. So if you are given the probability and you are asked to work backward to find the z-score, you can use this table. Let's do another one. Just to make so on the tape on the test, we're gonna have this table, right? We could quickly you look will, at it. but you will have you will use technology now. So there is a substitute to this in a second, you don't need to use it actually. So let okay. me show you another one. Oh, the table will pop up guys in any question. You, if you wanna use it, 
it will pop up automatically. I don't even need to provide it. Uh, let's do, I'm gonna pick another value guys. Just wanna see how good you are of using this table. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay, what would be the Z score? Look uh, at the table. Is the paper covering? No, it's not. No, let me see if I'm covering that. Let me mm -hmm. just put it. It would be 1.08. That's the closest one, probably. 1.08. Do you guys agree with the student? He looked at one, he says 0. 0. 0.8599 is the closest. And I do agree with you. It yeah. is the closest, yeah. Then you just get this one, 1. 1.08, excellent. So if you provide the area to the left, you can use the table to find the Z uh, score. Now guys, I think you would like to know how we could have done this using the calculator. And actually the calculator is going to give me a better than 1.08. It's going to give me a much more accurate answer. So let me show you how to use the calculator. This is where the second formula comes in, guys. That's the only one. Second. As you can see the title, guys, the name of the feature, it says inverse normal distribution. So it's the uh, total opposite, just working backward. Let's hit enter and see what's in there. Okay. It wants the three things from you. The first thing is the area to the left of the target that you're looking for. So I want the area to the left. This is the area to the left, which is 0. 0.8590. Wait, uh, is this number three, second, and then uh, variable yeah. number three? All right. Yeah. And then since we're working with Z scores, guys, it's zero, 01, that's it. And you're gonna get an answer better than 1.08, you will see. There's no million in this? So, um, Professor, we never changed the zero, 01 because no, any question because like this? No, working with Z. Okay. The answer is 1.075. Well, if you round it, it will be 1.08, but that's a more accurate answer here. Okay, let me go back. So this one, guys, remember the area to the left was 0. 0.7324 of the target and we got a 0. 0.62. Let me show you how you could have done this. Number three, 0. 0.7324. No changes here. And here we go, 0. 0.62. We got 0. 0.62 here. Let me just one more show you how we could have got this one, the 0 0.77. Uh, professor. Yes. Um, when I did on the invoice normal, my calculator uh, on it says on tail, left, center, right. Oh, you already right. have. Oh, okay. In this case, in this case, just put the number and put left because your your area is on the left. Just put left. So if it's on the right, I have to do right. Exactly. Or you will do what I'm going to do now. But since you your calculator gives you this feature, mine doesn't. If it is a right, you put right and put the value. If it is a left, you put left and put the value. And that should work just fine. Can you show us? Yeah. But I don't get it because I have the same calculator. Why does it tell me like Different this? Pro that your, your program is a newer one. So you got a newer uh, calculator. Oh. Yeah. All right. Let's... Uh, Let's do this now. So we're not going to use tables anymore. I'm going to show you the approach of using technology now. OK, watch, guys. I'm going to shade this region. And let's make it. It's less than 50%. So let's make this area 0 0.2561. And I want to find Z.
So do we use the uh, normal CDF or invert form? No, not normal CDF. We have a probability. Once I give you the area, guys, it's just like I gave you a probability. I need Z, so we're doing the inverse norm, definitely. So the only time you use normal CDF when he said, what is the probability? If he says, what is the probability? Then he wants you to use a probability. Okay, let's do this on the inverse norm. Negative six. Second and distribute. Yeah, I got negative okay. six. Is that correct or wrong? Negative uh, six, five, five, four. Yeah, that one. Yeah, you're right. Oh, so that's what you put, guys. You put 0 0.25. Yeah, I put one. that in okay. and then 0 and 1. That's not correct. And actually, oh. your answer, if you just get rid of the negative sign, your answer will be correct. And let me tell you why this is not uh, correct. This formula requires that you provide the area to the left, I said, of the target. Actually, I didn't give you the area to the left here. I gave you the area to the what? Right. To the right. So what would be the area to the left of my target? If this is 0 0.2561 on the right, what would be the area on the left, guys? Let me shade the area on the left. It's this area. 0.7349. And how did you figure it out? You take you one, minus. one minus. Thank you. So look what we're gonna do, guys. But for the student who says, I have a calculator that has right and uh, that says left and right, what you could do, just keep the 0 0.2561 in here and tell the calculator it's a right tail and then it will pick it up for you. So we're gonna do here one minus. Yeah, it worked. It's not a negative no more. Yeah. And here you go, guys. It's so 0 0.6. Right. Yeah. You're always adding the one first. Exactly. So it's 0 0.655. Even students, if you guys make a mistake and just put 0 0.2561 and you get negative 0 0.655, let me tell you how you can figure out the correct answer. Look at it. You know your Z score is positive because it's beyond zero from the right. So just change your negative answer to positive and that should be the correct answer. So Z here is 0 0.6. If you want to round it to two decimal places, it will be 0 0.66. Um, professor, mm -hmm. um, the calculator also has center. Which case will uh, we uh, have Not yet. Let me, let me just, I'll, I'll get to the center in a little bit, but just okay. focus on right and left for now. So your program is very good, better than ours, but let's, uh, the, we'll do it one step at a time. Okay, let me show you guys what the example that I'm showing you here. You see here, I'm giving you the area to the left. Your table, guys, as you know, table four that we talked about yesterday is constructed with areas to the left only. So that's why when you have something to the right, you have to do a one minus. Well, this is an area to the left. To find the z-score, look what you do. You just look inside for 0 0.3632, which is right here. I've done the math for you. And look, guys, if you read the z-score, it will be negative 0 0.35. But if you prefer to use technology, let me just do this. Second and distribute inverse norm. Put the area, which is 0 0.3632, and then mean 0, 1, paste, and round this to two decimal places, guys, you get negative 0 0.35. It's exactly the same thing. Okay, let's give you a last chance to practice with this. I'm just gonna sketch. This. So I'm shading an area to the left. I'm just gonna make it up. Let me make up the area. 0 
and I want the Z score. Okay, take a minute, guys, find me that Z score. So here's how you do it on the calculator. So negative zero, uh, usually Z scores guys will be rounded to two decimal places. So it's negative 0 0.19. Okay, let's see how the table would give you a zero point, whether the table will give you this. So remember it's 0 0.4257 guys, let's go to the table. Uh, for the table, uh, the closest to 42, what was it? What did I put? 4257, where's the closest guys? Four, two, five, seven. I would say this. Do you guys agree? Four, two, four, seven. That would be the closest. And can you read the Z score? It's negative 0 0.1. What? Can you see it, guys? So negative 0 0.1. And then look, nine. So the table is not bad. It will give you pretty much the same answer as the calculator, but the calculator is a lot faster and you don't have to carry a table with you uh, to do this. Okay. So uh, we're going to do a couple more uh, questions on this. Can we do some uh, more probability ones? Yeah, yeah, just it's, it's happening right now. I'm just going to pick the book and we're going to do a couple nice, really nice applications on how to use this. 36, it's on section 5.3, page 259. Let me show you guys the power of what you learned uh, today, what, what it means in real life applications. The annual per capita consumption of ice cream in pounds in the United States can be approximated by a normal distribution. So it's bell shaped, meaning most of us eat the same amount of ice, uh, uh, ice cream a year. Some of us eat very, very little and others eat too much ice cream. That's what the bell-shaped curve is. As shown in the figure, this is the figure that shows the distribution of ice cream lovers here, consumption of ice cream. Okay, so the mean consumption of ice cream guys per person in the United States is 17.9 pounds per year and the standard deviation is 4.4 pounds. Here's the question. What is the largest annual per capita consumption of ice cream that can be at the bottom 10% of consumption? Meaning guys, how many ice cream, pounds of ice cream a person should consume each year and be labeled as a bottom 10% consumer. So the consumers from the bottom who don't consume much ice cream. I'll, I'll sketch this one and show you what we're talking about. So for 36, this is the curve, guys. Uh, Mr. Bezzer. What is it? Oh. Yes, go uh, ahead. I'm listening. Nothing. The vo your voice was static before. I couldn't hear anything. Is it good now? Yeah, that's better now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And sigma is 4.4. Yeah, it could happen that the internet acts up and down. All right. If you are the bottom 10% consumer, guys, where would you place to the left or to the right, guys? Can you tell me? It says Professor, the, the, the picture is lagging. Left. To the left of it. To the left. Did he light, leave? Oh. No, I'm still here. Can you guys hear me? Prefer yeah. 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 The picture is lagging in your voice too. Let me just pause for a second. So question A was again, what is the largest annual per capita consumption of ice cream that can be at the bottom 10%? If you are at the bottom 10%, I'm one of those 10% guys because I don't eat lots of ice cream. So it should be on the left below the mean and this is your 10 percent right here when he says 10 percent the bottom 10 percent guys he's giving you the area and he's asking you to find the actual value so he wants to know 
what would x be here so that you know the values that are to the left of x are make 10 percent of all ice cream consumers in the united states so when he asks you for x guys it is an inverse norm can you guys help me out fill in the three ingredients here let me put the calculator so you can see what's going on here so second distribute inverse norm okay let me clear here what would be the area to the left guys uh point one point one excellent is that right yeah that is right <laughs> uh, yes all right 17 and then you don't use a mean of zero and one here because we're not working with Z anymore. We're working with the actual value guys, which is X. So what would be the mean? He gave you the mean, which is what? 17.9. And then the standard deviation is what? 4.4. Now for the students who have a left, right, center, just put left there and then you should get you know the same answer because we're doing a left. And you're ready. It's going to be less than 17.9 pounds for sure. 12.3 pounds. 17.9, 4.4, and it's 12.3 pounds. So if you consume 12.3 pounds or less ice cream per year, you are one of the bottom 10% of consumption in the United States. You don't have to consume 12.3 to be considered bottom 10%. Anything lower than 12.3 pounds up uh, down to zero will count you as the bottom 10%. That tells you guys how much we love ice cream and how much we eat ice cream. I mean, the average is a lot, 18 pounds per year. That's a lot of ice cream. Okay. B. This is... Uh, those students you ask me about middle or center. Between what two values does the middle 80% of consumption lie? Let me explain this to you guys. And if you see a question like that in the homework, you deal with it exactly the same way I'm gonna deal with it right here. So middle 80%, let me sketch it guys to show you a visual. Okay, middle 80%, so put 80% in the middle right here. And shade it, that's the 80, middle 80%. So as you can see guys, there are two values here that I need to find. I need to find this X value, and that X value. I'm gonna label them differently. I'm gonna call them X1 and x2 can you guys help me find them using the inverse norm how would you find the first one let me just start and see if a student can help can guess what the area should be inverse norm what would be the area so i'm guessing 40 and 40. so that's 80 here how much 40? is left for the tails, guys? How much is left for the tails? 20% uh, total. 20% total. So each tail is well, how much? 10. 10%. Exactly. Wait, how many tails are there? Two. Two. Tails. Uh -oh. So why would... Uh, 20 divided by 2 is 10. Because look, it has to equal to 1 total. 100%. Oh. 100%. Always. That's, that's the rule of probability, guys. The total should always be 100%, total area under the curve. Sum of probabilities that cannot exceed one. Okay, so for X1, guys, look what we do. For the first value, we're gonna do 0 0.1. Uh, the mean, which is 17.9, and then 4.4. Can you guys tell me what we're gonna do, how we're gonna do it with X2 now? Uh, 90.9 percent .9%. exactly but there will be because 
if the area to the right is 10%, guys, the area to the left is, uh, uh, it will be 90%. So 0 0.9, 7.9, 17.9, 4.4. Now for the students who have the calculator that has a center there, look, look what you do. You go to inverse norm, you put 80%. And then you just put choose center and it will give you both values. Wait, why did you use 0.9 again? Oh, 0.9, yeah. because look, I need this value. My calculator, the program in the calculator will require that I provide not the area to the right of the value, the area to the left. If this is 10% on the right, how much remains on the left will be 90%. So look, the bottom line is this 10% and the 10% and 90% will add up to one. So once you figure out the first one, the second one will automatically be the complement to make it 100%. They should add up to 100%. So let's find the values. Actually, guys, we already did X1 in part A. So let's see. Look, it's X1 we're done in part A, so that's 12.3. And then uh, X2 should be 23.53. Exactly, 23.5. So people who eat 23.5 pounds of ice cream or more are considered the top 10%. You see, it's higher right here. And that is, uh, that's what middle 8% is. So pretty much the center is the average amount of people, like most of the people eat ice cream in that area, uh, right? It depends. No, no, it, it just, it's a middle, it's a middle value. One from the left and one from the right. Okay. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, why didn't you do like in the inverse norm 0 0.8 and then 17.9 and 4.4? <laughs> oh, 0 0.8, because the inverse norm, the 0 0.8, it, it has to be an area to the left. The 0 0.8 is not an area to the left. It's an area in the middle. So and the area to, to the left, left will be 0 0.90, 80 plus 10, 90 percent. Oh, okay. Not okay, you cannot just easy. stop here, you have to go all the way to end. Okay. Good questions, guys. Good questions. All right, let's show you another one exercise that really uh, makes sense why we should learn this. It's, that's one of my favorite questions. It's number 40, how to write a guarantee. You guys, if you replace old tires, you know, in a car with the new tires, they usually give you a warranty. And they tell you, uh, we will replace, you know, your tires free of a charge if they wear out before a certain number of miles, correct? That's how this warranty is worded. How do they figure out this certain number of miles and give it to you? They'll tell you 20,000 miles or if you use the tires for three years, whichever comes first. That's the wording of the warranty. How do they figure out you know, this wording? How do they determine how many miles, uh, after how many miles you know, they won't replace the tires anymore? It's all predetermined, you're not know, just using probability. And let me read the question and then we can do it together. You sell a brand of automobile tire that has a life expectancy that's normally distributed. The mean life of the tire guys is 30,000 miles and the standard deviation is 2,500 miles. So uh, 40. mean is so the average uh, life of the tire is 30,000 miles and the standard deviation guys is 2,500 miles you want to give a guarantee for free replacement nobody would buy a tire if they don't give you a guarantee for free replacement of tires that do not wear well you are willing to replace approximately 10 percent of the tires how should you war, uh, word your guarantee? So now guys, you understand how the business decide how many tires uh, to replace. They say, we can replace up to 10% of what we sell. And then they figure out, you know, just they can add, you know, just up a little bit money to the selling price to account, you know, for the 10% of the tires that uh, they replace. So if a company sells, let's say, 
thousand tires a year, they're willing to replace hundred of them and not the rest of them. So only a hundred and the 900 other tires cannot be replaced. How can they word their guarantee guys in order to only replace 10% of the tires no more? They have to figure out how many miles they have to put, you know, just in the guarantee statement before they can uh, replace, you know, the tires. So we're gonna figure this out right now. So look, let's just sketch it. And the mean guys, we know it's 30,000 miles. Can you lift your sheet up, Professor? Mm -hmm. Right here. All right. Where would the 10% be, guys? Would the 10% be here on the right or on the left? The 10% that they would replace. Common sense, guys. If you are the manager of the business and you want to just be to the right on the left. Okay. For the students who said to the right, if you were working for this company, they will fire you right away. Let me tell you why. Because if it's it's under 2,500 miles. Because if you put the 10% here, that means you're telling the customers that even if your tire wears out after 30,000 miles, we still can replace it. Remember, guys, nobody would replace a tire after it reaches its average lifetime. Then they will go out of business because everybody will end up replacing the tires. You want only to replace tires that were not driven much. They were not used as much. So it has to be below the 30,000. So your 10% has to be here. That's the tire, and that's the 10%, guys. You will go bankrupt, guys, if you do the 10% on the right, because everybody will end up replacing their tires. So you just do it on the left, 10%. And I need to know the mileage on this tire here. Can you guys help me figure it out? What would that be? Inverse norm. Can you tell me what the three magic components are? What's the first one? Point one. Very good. And then what? 30,500. Excellent. And guys, you're not gonna be surprised. The warranty statement is gonna have less than 30,000 miles in it. Watch, go to inverse. So this one, Professor, I put to the left for the tail. Yeah. Yep. Even if you put nothing, it's going to take it to the left by default, I believe. Uh, 30,000. Uh, I didn't expect a student to have this program, uh, but that's fine. You can use it. And watch, guys. So 26,800 miles. So how would you word the warranty? Can someone tell me? Let's say you work at the tire store, a bell tire, and you would replace tires that what? What would you say in the warranty? So tires that, so you will only replace tires that don't wear well before you have reached 28,000 miles or 27,000 miles on the tires. Still after lot. after 27,000 miles, guys, you will not replace those tires. Okay. So imagine, you know, just you put the 10% here, you were going to get like in the 30,000, you know, just miles after the average. That can't happen. Um, and uh, this is one reason... Uh, Image. The time spent in days waiting for a heart transplant for people ages 35 to 49 can be approximated by a normal distribution as shown in the figure. And the figure is right there, guys. So on average, people have to wait 203 days if they are candidate for a heart transplant with a standard deviation of 25.7 days. Let me remind you of percentile first before I get into the question. 
if I tell you guys, if I, I tell one student that on the first test you scored in the 90th percentile, I'm trying to tell the students that you did better than 90% of the students. And 10% of the students did better than you. That's what a percentile means. So if I tell a student that you did in the 70th percentile, it means 70% of the students were below you, 30% of the students were above you. That's what a percentile means. It doesn't mean a grade, it doesn't mean a percent, it just means a location, you know, just uh, comparing to the rest of the group. So we know that the mean wait time for a heart transplant is 203 days and the standard deviation is 25.7. The question is, what wait time would be represented in the fifth percentile? So what would be the fifth percentile here? Let me sketch this one, guys, and then you can see what we're talking about. So fifth percentile means 5% of the people below you and 95% of the people are above you. So you guys, you're gonna help me tell me where I'm gonna shade the 5%. Is it to the right or to the left? Common sense. The left. I agree. And it is to the left, guys, because you're saying, I tell you the definition of percentile. A definition of percentile means 5% are below you. If you put the X here, and then you shade 5% to the right, that means you're saying 5% are above you and 95% below you. That's not correct. And actually, it's very good for a patient to be in the low percentile, means low wait time. That's an advantage. You want that, you want that, you know, just to be on the low side. So then that patient will get the transplant, you know, sooner than uh, other uh, patients. So how would you figure this out? That will be inverse norm. Can you guys help me? What, what, what are the three values? 0 0.05. 1, 0, 0.05, comma, the mean, which is what, 200, I forgot. 203.25, I think. 203 and 25.7. So 203 and then 25.7 days. And you get the answer, guys. Let's see what the answer is. Inverse norm. You won't see much of this inverse norm after this section. We'll go back to probability, but uh, just to show you. So let's see how long this patient would have to wait before he gets a heart transplant. 160 days, about 171, uh, 61 days. Okay, what about the next question, guys? Help me with this one. What waiting time represent the third quartile? Where do you think the third quartile is? Third quartile, guys, means the three quarter. 75. What's the three quarter as a percent? 75. Exactly, 75%. So guys, you should agree it's gonna be here. That's 75%. It has to be more toward the right because it's more than 50%. So that will be, guys. And it's actually, it's bad news. If, if I were a patient, I, I would prefer to be in the low percentile because the wait time will be a, let, a lot less than this guy in the 75th percentile. That will be inverse norm. 0 0.75, guys. 203 <laughs> and 25.7. Uh, Watch. Let's see. Uh, 220 days, almost 221. Okay, 221 days. Thank you. That's a lot of, that's a lot more days than the other guy. Definitely, definitely. So when it comes to wait time, guys, you prefer to be in the low percentile. 
But when it comes to making money, getting scores on the test, you prefer to be in the high percentile. So it all depends on the situation. Um, that is what I wanted you to know. And the last thing we wanna do in here before we wrap up this section is just do this exercise. Uh, exercise nine, it's about z-scores. Let me just put the formula for the z-score first. All right. Mute guys, mute yourself. A vet records the weights of cats treated at a clinic. The weights are normally distributed with the mean of nine pounds and a standard deviation of two pounds. So that's the mean. And that's a standard deviation, sigma. Find the weight x corresponding to z-score. So he's given you the z-scores and he wants the x value. Okay, if you have the x value, guys, you put it here, you put the mean, you put the standard deviation, you can find the z-score. How would you do it vice versa? I'm gonna show you. This is a little bit of algebra. So forget about statistics now. Can you guys help me solve for x? How do I use this to solve for X? We gotta input, we gotta input everything and then we'll solve for it. No, without, before we do that, we can get a formula for X. I'm gonna get you a formula rather than, I, what you said can be done, but we're gonna do it simpler. Do you guys know about the cross multiplication like this? So oh. you can say X minus mean equals Z times Sigma. And can, how can I solve for X, guys? I need to get rid of this. What do I do? Add on both sides. Thank you. And you get this formula for X. So write it down, guys. This is a new formula for X, if you know Z. Okay, All right. And now he gives me Z. And he wants X and look how easy it is to find X when Z is 1.96 guys. Look how do you find X? I said it's the mean, which is nine plus 1.96 times the standard deviation two. And that should be guys 12.92. When X is negative 0 0.4, Z is negative 0 0.44, guys. How do you find X? Nine plus negative 0 0.44 times two. It will be 8.12. When X is zero, when Z is zero, when Z is zero, guys, you are right at the mean. So X should be the mean. And I'm gonna show you that it is the mean actually. Nine plus zero times two, which is nine. Okay. Exercise 10, that's the last one with section 5.3. Okay, that's another interesting example, guys, how uh, inverse norm is used. Scores for the California Peace Officer Standards and Training Tests are normally distributed with a mean of 50 and standard deviation of 10. So usually the average score is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. An agency will only hire applicants with scores in the top 10%. What would be the score would qualify someone to be hired, guys, if you are only selecting the top 10%? Let me sketch it right here so you can see what we're talking about. The top 10%, so wouldn't that be 90? Okay, that's correct. So mean, so what you're telling me that the top 10% should be an area what? 90. On the right. Correct? Yeah. Can you lower the paper a bit, please? Yeah. Thank you. Actually, on my side, I have to hire it, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So this is the 10%. Definitely top performers on the test, guys, can't be on the left, can't be below the mean. They have to be above the mean. 
So that's why I put the area on the right. Be honest with you guys, this is what confused students when it comes to this question, deciding where do I put the 10% right and left because it makes a difference when you use the inverse norm. So with the practice guys, you should be able to pick it up. So if I wanna find the answer now, I need this X. It will be what? Inverse norm. Okay, can you tell me the area? Zero point what now? Nine. Nine. Because Except for the student who has the left, right, center, you don't have to worry about it. But the rest of you, yes, you need the area to the left. And then mean is 50. And standard deviation is 10. And can you guys tell me what the answer is? 52.82. And it makes sense, guys. It has to be above average. So it's about 63. So anyone who scores 63 or higher, will be uh, admitted, you know, just to the program. If you're doing um, area to the right, don't you have to do one minus? What is it? If you're doing area to the right, don't you have to do one minus? No, if, you're, if your calculator has right, just put 0 0.1 and so select right, it will give you the same answer. So basically when it's on the right of the mean, you it's just a one minus 10%. Exactly, exactly. That's pretty much it, yeah, 100%. Yeah, the normal on the left 